Good evening, everybody. I think uh, you can hear me. You can see me as well, hopefully, uh, as well as the presentation of our uh, lecturer tonight with Professor Andrei Varlamov. We are extremely lucky to have our opening uh, series of lectures of the Institute of Physics at Wolfram Anton, a renowned uh, speaker, someone who I think gave this talk last time at MIT, where there was Brian Green in the audience. A short biography of Professor Varlamov, his research director at the CNR in Italy, in Rome, which is an institute where they study exotic materials, superconductors and things like that. Professor Varlamov himself is actually a very famous researcher on the topic of superconductivity. He wrote a very famous textbook and uh, highly regarded works on the theory of fluctuation in superconductivity, beyond infinite theory and these kind of things. But his interest goes much beyond this uh, very specialized topic he actually uh, delights uh, the physicists and uh, everybody at large with his work on uh, food and cooking. He wrote many textbooks, many books, uh, several of uh, whom uh, won uh, accolades on uh, popular physics. And um, he is uh, particularly famous for having uh, written something which is related to the perfect uh, pizza equation, or how to cook the perfect pizza. Uh, he did his PhD under the supervision of someone who is also very famous, uh, and, uh, Alex Alexander Abrikosov, who is the Nobel Prize for Superconductivity, I believe 2003 Nobel Prize. And uh, while Professor Valamov didn't get the Nobel Prize yet, he actually, I believe, was nominated for the famous Ig Nobel Prize uh, related to his work on the perfect pizza equation, of which we hope to hear about this evening. He received several um, uh, and prestigious uh, recognitions. He's Dr. Honoris Causa of several institutions. I think uh, as a few selection of things that really impressed me, he's been uh, the, uh, the the winner of the Olympiads in 1971, I believe, of the Physics Olympiad. He won prizes from the Lenin Komsomol Prize, the Prix Robert Val for his, one of his books on physics. And uh, as I said, uh, he's Dr. Honoris Causa of uh, various institutions, including the Mediterranean Institute of Physics. Um, Professor Valamov, being Ukrainian, born is uh, nowadays uh, an Italian uh, citizen. So very uh, happy position to tell us about foods, uh, pizzas and coffee. So I will uh, let him speak for the uh, for as long as it will be required for us to know about the art of cooking well. Professor Valamov, please, the floor is yours and thanks again for opening this series of lectures. Uh, uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody. Dear Fabrice, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, presentation and tonight uh, I'm speaking with you from Italy and it is natural to speak about uh, physics in kitchen in the kitchen and exploring the gastronomic universe. Um, uh, instead of the outline of my talk, I will show you a very short video which will mainly let's say eight of ten points, I can treat in the uh, terms of physics. So let's start. I'm <laughs> 
Okay, so this nice video was done by the uh, interpret and the parental you saw the affiliations and uh, now I will pass to uh, the discussion of the um, the main formula of uh, culinary. So let's start from the discussion what means denaturation process of proteins. So of course this is extremely uh, uh, complicated uh, phenomenon and being physicist, not uh, chemist and not um, biochemist, so I will uh, propose some very simple model which will be enough for our purposes. So I will imagine that the raw meat consists of the folded proteins, so very long chains which are folded at the temperature of the embryo. Uh, so when our temperature increases, so the proteins unfold and at some temperature they form some, they compactify. So they, if you want, form some carpet. So the transition from raw meat to boiled meat uh, is uh, consists of uh, the uh, unfolding of proteins and then formation, their compactification and formation of this carpet. From the energetic point of view, you can see this diagram uh, where I present free energy of the system and the native state passed to the denaturated state through uh, by means of Arrhenius law when system uh, uh, due to the increase of temperature uh, overpassed this barrier. So, um, so what means that uh, I will boil uh, some piece of meat? I will imagine it as a, some uh, solid sphere and uh, in order to do not find some unpleasant surprises like 
the blue in the center of the piece. So I have to reach the temperature of denaturation for this protein, which, for instance, for fish is 47 centigrade, for uh, yolk of the egg is 64, for beef it is 74 centigrade. So I have to um, uh, deliver the heat so uh, in such a way that in the center of my sphere the temperature will, will reach 74 centigrade let's say speaking about uh, the beef um, of course uh, this is a very simple model uh, there is a well-known joke when uh, the uh, physicist a physicist meets a mathematician at the hippodrome uh, and he asked, uh, are you gambling? Do you um, play on the horses? He told, not. I just uh, worked out the simple model of the spherical horse which moves in the vacuum. Uh, so I do more, more or less the same. Uh, of course, this model can be solved exactly. I mean that I can write the uh, equation of heat transfer which you see uh, the screen uh, for the spherical symmetry i can uh, apply the boundary conditions so that the temperature of all piece of meat uh, is let's say four centigrade i took it just from the fridge and then uh, external i uh, uh, apply uh, i create the heat flow um, applying the temperature uh, 100 centigrade at the border. And then I will uh, study, I can find how temperature is distributed uh, uh, in the uh, bulk of this sphere as a function of time. And then I can uh, require that in the uh, central point at some moment, T temperature will reach 74. Let's say uh, this is a direct and rigorous way, but uh, I don't want to solve here the differential equation. So I will do much more simple. Uh, I will say that I will evaluate this value and I will say that 74 is not far from 100. So uh, I will assume that the time of delivery of the necessary temperature to the center of the solid sphere depends only on on its material parameters and size, uh, namely the thermal conductivity of the meat, its density, specific heat, and radius of the solid sphere. Therefore, we see the dependence of the required time on the size of the sphere in the fourth. I will assume that uh, uh, the uh, um, cooking time depends on this parameter uh, in potential form. This is assumption, of course, but uh, it is confirmed by exact solution. So, uh, if I will write um, the, uh, I will look for the cooking time as the combination of uh, heat conductivity in power alpha, density in power beta, heat capacity in power gamma, and radius in power delta. So, comparison of the dimensionality from the left hand side and right hand side immediately gives me the values of alpha beta gamma and delta and i find that the delivery time from such consideration is proportional to the square of the radius and uh, inversely proportional to uh, so-called uh, thermal diffusivity uh, which is a combination of heat conductivity divided on the density and heat capacity. Uh, so this is the delivery time, uh, and uh, but uh, it does not mean that it is necessary only to deliver uh, the heat and to increase temperature up to the denaturation uh, temperature uh, value. Uh, probably some time <laughs> needs some mm, the reaction of formation of this carpet. Uh, so mm, uh, I add to the delivery time, which I write in the form AD squared plus B, where D is uh, uh, 
uh, to R, uh, I add some value B. So A D squared is the delivery time, but B is the time necessary for formation of the carpet from this unfolded, um, unfolded um, uh, nodes. Uh, how we can um, uh, how we can evaluate it? Uh, simple enough. Look, uh, if you boil the let's say half a kilo of meat, one pound of meat, you have uh, boiled meat or broth. It takes from the practice uh, we know that it takes at least one hour. At the same time, when you go to Chinese restaurant and you order hot pot, which what we usually did with uh, Professor Kavokin, so you can see that the meat is sliced very thin, thin so maybe one millimeter in thickness. And it is enough to uh, 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 put it in the boiling broth for 10, 20 seconds, and it is already edible, already edible. So uh, in the case of so thin slice of meat, uh, the delivery time is very small. It is possible to evaluate it. It will be one second. Other 10, 20 seconds are necessary for chemical um, process. So for formation of this cut. So I wrote here tau cooking is a d square plus b, and this b will serve me in the next slides for other reasons. But when we're speaking about the uh, boiling of the uh, large macroscopic piece of meat, like a, a sphere of one pound, two pounds, so of course b we can just neglect. We will see this on the next example. So uh, uh, Dr. Charles Williams, a lecturer in physics at the University of Exeter, uh, indeed uh, solved the equation of uh, heat transfer for the egg to uh, uh, find the cooking time for, for the egg uh, alecoque. Uh, and um, he found the, uh, for he solved, uh, so, uh, solved it for the elliptic geometry, and he found that cooking time is proportional to the mass in power two over three and logarithm of initial temperatures, temperature of denaturation of yolk, uh, of uh, initial temperature of egg, and boiling water, temperature of boiling water. You see that actually with the accuracy of logarithm, his answer coincides with mine because I wrote a d square, but mass is proportional to d cube. So when I speak about a d square, he got mass in power to third. So my very simple evaluation with the accuracy of logarithm reproduced the exact results of Professor Williams. Um, uh, we was once we was uh, already decided. Professor Kavokin decided to prepare the Thanksgiving Day turkey. And uh, when we uh, bought turkey, we throw away the um, uh, package where the recommended cooking time was printed. So we um, uh, looked for it in the internet and we found interesting um, table where you see here the mass of turkey in pounds and recommended cooking time in hours. Here, of course, the, uh, the baking of Thanksgiving turkey or geese or uh, um, goose is much more uh, complicated because this is not boiling. Uh, you have to, re here it is necessary to perform so-called Maillard reaction, which uh, uh, differs uh, the boil, uh, boiled meat from baked meat. So the temperature should be around 140 centigree uh, uh, for Turkey. Uh, but uh, I do not have time to discuss all these interesting details. But the essence is the same. I need to deliver some temperature. It will be 140, let's say. 
up to the central part of uh, the Turkey, which we, I will present as a sphere again. In any case, I will use just the right formula. So cooking time is some parameter A, uh, which depends on material, the mass of my turkey in power to third plus B. And I suppose that this formula still works, even if the shape of the turkey is not ideally uh, the spherical. So you see that mass in pounds and cooking times in hours are related in some strange way. So it is the evidence of nonlinear dependence. So if someone tell you for each pound of turkey at 15 minutes, do not believe him. Evidently, the dependence is not linear. But if you present it in the coordinate tau as a function of the mass and power to start, you see the perfect line which goes to zero finally. And it means that indeed you can forget about this B. Very good. Now I want to recycle my just created uh, theory to the physics of pasta, what is very important in eating. So what does it mean to cook pasta? In the flour, the starch molecules are grouped in granules with a diameter of 10, 30 microns, which in turn are surrounded by different proteins. In the process of pasta production, two of them, the gliadin and glutenin, combine with water and form a continuous network called gluten, which is strong and has low permeability for water molecules. This network covers starch granules. The cooking time is directly related to the ability of the starch molecules surrounded by gluten in the pasta drying process to absorb water, which begins to penetrate through the network of gluten and spreads inside the pasta with some delay with respect to the moment as it is placed in the pot of boiling water. At a temperature about 70 centigrade, the starch molecules begin to form a gel-like compound which prevents absorption of water. Pasta is considered al dente when gelatinous starch absorbs a minimal quantity of water needed to make it sufficiently soft. Hence, to cook pasta, it is necessary to supply hot water inside the initial dry spaghetti. Very good. So, oppositely to the previous consideration, it is not enough to deliver heat. It is not in, enough to create the heat flow, but it is necessary also to deliver water uh, inside the spaghetti. I will speak now only, I will consider the model of cylindrical pasta. So um, I will not consider uh, mezzapenne and uh, the Italians have at least 500 different types of pasta. I will speak only about the cylindrical pasta for simplicity. So, uh, heat transfer we just discussed. It is, de uh, it is described by uh, uh, the uh, heat uh, uh, diffusion equation. And water diffusion, fortunately, described by the same equation. But instead of temperature, I will write uh, the concentration of water. And instead of um, the um, thermal diffu uh, diffusion coefficient, I will put the water diffusion coefficient. Equal equations, equal solutions. So again, I can look for, I can believe that solution, the, 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 the cooking time for cylindrical pasta will depend on the diameter of this pasta as a AD square. You can see that the fact that uh, now I consider the uh, cylindric geometry instead of spherical one does not change this result. The, so cooking time will be AD squared plus B. Before B was the time of compactification of the proteins. Now B is uh, uh, plays the first role, the most important role. That A is some combination of the heat conductivity, density, diffusion coefficient. I don't know. Uh, the, the, this is material parameter. But B actually depends on the nationality of the eater. Indeed, Italians prefer to eat pasta al dente. So uh, in my model, this means that I have 
to supply water and heat not to the very axis, very central part of the cylinder. So this will be the simple model uh, which will um, take into account what means spaghetti al dente. If some other uh, uh, the people uh, consider pasta not as the main dish which serves sauces like do Italians, but they consider uh, pasta as a side dish, so often uh, they want to have a well done, well cooked pasta. So this B can be or zero or even uh, to uh, transform it in porridge, uh, B should be positive. So let's go to the supermarket. Let's buy very different kinds of cylindrical pasta, like the thinnest one, cap uh, Capellini number one, with a diameter only 100, uh, one 0.15 millimeters. Spaghetti number three, uh, spaghetti number five, uh, vermicelli number seven, uh, vermicelli number eight, bucatini. Uh, all diameters you can find in the second column. And the third one you can find the bucatini, which are the, um, uh, the most uh, thick pasta, 2.7 millimeter. They have internal a uh, uh, hole by some reasons, and we will understand why. Then I will read what is written at the uh, packages. It is written three minutes. Uh, so these are the recommended cooking times for Italians. And you can find that it changed from three to 13 minutes and it reduced to eight. So I will apply my formula that uh, tau is AD squared plus B. I have two unknown parameters because tau is recommended, D I measure. So I define A and B from the two experimental points. So I believe that spaghetti five minutes um, and vermicelli number eight, 13 minutes are reference points. What allows me to reproduce, the uh, to find that A and B has the 3.8 minutes per millimeter square and B is minus 10 minutes. Uh, uh, please pay attention that this is very relative because I bought pasta of some uh, uh, producer um, of some uh, um, kind of uh, the Italian uh, producer of pasta. So this parameter can change from one to another producer. So uh, let's try to use my formula, now I know A and B, let's try to use my formula to uh, reproduce other results. You see that for Capellini it works bad. Instead of three minutes, I have two. For spaghetti number three, no sense to speak, because it is reference point, but for spaghetti number five, it reproduced very well, 8.2 instead of mm, eight minutes. Uh, for vermicelli number seven, 10.7 .7 instead of 11. Uh, but with Bucatini, I have the complete uh, the uh, bankruptcy of the theory uh, break of this theory. I have 25 minutes instead of eight because the cooking time increases very fast with uh, the growth of the diameter. So let's try to improve my theory. So uh, actually, um, I did not take into account that in Bucatini there is a hole. So if Italians do this hole, it has some sense. What sense can have this hole? I see two solutions. First, that the hot water enters in this hole, and I do not need more to deliver, to supply heat and water to the central part. This is number one. Number two, one could suppose, assume that instead of one heat flow from the uh, outside of the um, uh, Bucatino, I have another heat flow from the central part, but this will be wrong because actually to deliver heat, I need the heat flow, not just temperature. So yes, water will enter in it, but the length of Bucatino is 23 centimeters and diameter of the hole is only one millimeter. So I cannot, by 
um, supporting fire, uh, making boiling water in the uh, saucepan, I cannot uh, uh, deliver the second flow. So I will just improve my formula, extracting from the inter external diameter internal one, and with the same parameters, and you see that it is more than enough. I reproduce the correct cooking time, 8.2 instead of uh, 8 uh, um, advised, recommended, and 25, the theory, without this correction. Now let's return to Capellini. With Capellini also is not all good, because instead of three, I got two minutes. It is uh, too uh, short time. But I want to attract your attention on the simplicity uh, uh, of my uh, model, because I told you that uh, to take into account uh, that um, pasta should be prepared al dente, I suppose that some central part uh, close to the axis should not be cooked at all, because water do not arrive there and heat does not arrive. So, uh, um, if you take a look at the, if you take a look at the uh, equation a d square plus b, you see that exists some value d critical when this solution, because b is negative, so exists some critical diameter where this solution uh, equation is satisfied. So, abhorrent uh, absurdum, tending to the absurdity. I can say that in my model exists some virtual pasta of the diameter 0 0.85 millimeter, which is not necessary to cook at all. You can eat it without boiling, without cooking. So you see that 0 0.85 is not too far from 115. So the deviation, the, the breakdown of my formula at small diameters is related to the roughness of the proposed model. Okay, now I want to tell you about one famous Ig Nobel Prize. So the French physicist Audoli and Neukirch published in PRL in August of 2005, they published very nice uh, study of the breaking of spaghetto. By spaghetto, I will call one cylinder, one, a piece of pasta, of cylindrical pasta. So uh, they considered the road, the dynamics of a road fragment following the initial breaking, even in a, so they, uh, I will show, uh, uh, probably it is difficult to show. Okay, I will do the following. Look, please, here uh, you can, you see what happens. So you take one spaghetto and uh, uh, make an arc, as you see here. And um, what happens? Uh, usually it breaks for three or four pieces. And this is counterintuitive because it seems that it should be break for two pieces. How to explain them? And um, the uh, authors of this article, uh, they uh, approached very seriously. First of all, they did the fast um, recording. You see results of it. And uh, then they proposed the model, uh, they uh, wrote the Kirchhoff equations, the differential equations of fourth order, resolved it, uh, it, it, it uh, uh, did a numerical simulation, but I will explain you very simple what happens. When you uh, make the arc, so uh, at some critical value, the spaghetto will be broken. It will be broken, uh, it is homogeneous, but always there is a, some uh, weak point. And let's suppose that it will happen in some uh, weak point, not in the center for the very beginning, at some point. So what happens? The only, what is changed are boundary conditions. The extremes of your road, now one is fixed, another is free. So what the road under the tension, so uh, curved road would like to do? It would like, it will start to oscillate. And what will be the period of this oscillation? You have 23 centimeters 
maybe remained 18, I don't know, even 15. So you understand that the uh, oscillations will have the period of uh, 100 milliseconds, something like this. At the same time, the break of Stogetto generates the flash through wave in it. And uh, this is a sound wave. And the characteristic velocities, speeds of uh, the sound waves in solids are kilometers per hour. So you understand that propagation of this, uh, propagation of this flash of wave and distribution, uh, the authors calculated, you see the distribution of nodes in it. So you see that in this point, uh, the, the first maximum, uh, the curvature will be 40% more than it was just before breaking. So, uh, because this happens in milliseconds and relaxation of the road due to oscillations are hundreds of milliseconds. So practically this flexure uh, um, uh, tension, so the increase of curvature is uh, added to the initial one. In result, in the point uh, K0, you will have the second break. You already will have three pieces. If the first break happened close to the center, so you can have four pieces. Uh, and uh, it is very beautiful. Uh, if I would not like, uh, I could show you because I have here pasta. Uh, I can show you this, uh, but uh, I do not want to have time. So uh, please take a look uh, at the, uh, these uh, registrations. Uh, yet, uh, uh, in 2018s, two students of Massachusetts Institute of Technology had succeeded to break spaghetto in, into two pieces. So very recently, Ronald, Ronald Heiser and Vishal Patil, two students from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, working on a scientific project proposed by their tutor, Jon uh, Dunhill, managed to overcome the magical reluctance of spaghetti to split into two parts. For this, as it turned out, it is just enough to turn the spaghetto, let's say, at 300 degrees along its axis. They created this um, device. And so first you uh, turn it for 360 degrees. In this case, after the first break, only the part of energy of this break released, is, uh, uh, energy released in this break is used for the excitation of the flexural wave. The rest is consumed by for rotation of the pieces of spaghetti. So actually, you excite two different modes, torsion one and flexural one. And torsion is the energy, and consequently, the, man, the amount of energy released is no longer sufficient, no longer sufficient for the second break. This is very beautiful. Uh, um, Italians uh, are very careful in combining of the shape of pasta and uh, the viscosity of sauce. Of course, they do not write equations, but for um, uh, curiosity, I just uh, 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 proposed the model uh, of, uh, so I took a cylinder and poured in it some viscous liquid uh, and looked how under the gravity uh, the flow of this liquid will enter in the cylinder. And after very simple consideration, I found, then I told that gravi gravity and acceleration is the same, uh, internal part and external more or less the same, and they found that uh, uh, the criterion is that you should uh, be careful to do not mix too much, uh, too long, because pasta and sauce must be hot. So you have some finite time to mix. And it is proportional to eta divided d square. So increasing uh, viscosity four times, you need to choose pasta uh, twice uh, larger in size. 
um, in Italy usually in a, a high level uh, pasta are um, um, uh, prepared uh, trafilati con bronzo so as they are um, prepared uh, in a special way to make uh, their um, surface uh, rough to, to, to stop to uh, do, uh, do not permit to soles to fall down okay so now let's pass to the next interesting uh, phenomena uh, namely physics of pizza uh, usually I uh, go to the same pizza in Ro uh, pizzeria in Rome and f uh, very soon I uh, made a friendship with Pizzaiolo and he told me Andre do not come to eat pizza between 8 and 10 p.m. I asked her or before or after I asked him why he told me because uh, the Roman pizza so thin uh, pizza uh, of 0 0.5 centimeter more or less with some sauces which is very different from the Napolitan pizza which is uh, thick and with uh, high borders uh, so uh, usually uh, the, if my dough is of 24 hours of fermentation so the optimal temperature is 325-330 centigrade and I can uh, bake one pizza in two minutes. I can manage two pizzas simultaneously in the oven. So we speak about the um, wood oven, what is the best. And uh, so I can produce 50-60 pizza per hour. And uh, in the rush time uh, when I have 60-70 uh, uh, clients and uh, uh, another 20 are waiting to take away pizza. So I'm forced to increase uh, temperature to 390. In this case, I can bake one pizza in 70 seconds and I increase my productivity. But the dough can be a little bit burned. And it was a basic. So I uh, decided uh, that maybe I can reproduce these uh, numbers. And by the way, to uh, shed a light on the uh, why Italians prefer to go to eat pizza in uh, pizzerias with wood oven. So uh, let's start from the farm. These two elephants are in good health. They have both temperature 36.1 Celsius and the distribution of temperature is constant. Uh, if the child is uh, has a fever, let's say 38 centigrade and his mom does not have a thermometer so usually he touch his head with hand let's suppose it uh, for symmetry that mother uh, touched uh, the head of child with her head so both of them of the same materials so the distribution of temperature uh, um, as a position from the interface you see at this figure and evidently that at the interface temperature will be the average 37. But now let's suppose uh, let's make the Gedanken experiment so let's suppose that mother has a steel head in this case you understand that uh, the distribution will be asymmetrical so actually steel will uh, allow to um, uh, um, uh, take away uh, uh, heat from child faster and the temperature at the interface will go down. Uh, so I want to understand that so the, my question is if I have two medias with different parameters heat conductivity, heat capacity, density and one um, uh, semi space uh, at the minus infinity has temperature T1, another T2. So, what will be the temperature at interface? Uh, for this, I will just write the um, heat flow, uh, which I will define as a quantity of heat which passed through the area S in time delta T. 
and this is a heat flow. And as we know, it is related uh, with the gradient of temperature and by means of the uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, so, uh, instead of, again, solving of the differential equations, I will make some simple evaluation. Let's suppose that the, I want to know how the front of temperature uh, penetrates in the uh, in this semi space. So I will consider the heat flow, so delta Q, which pass from the uh, okay, actually from the right to the left, but uh, here I did vice versa. So delta Q uh, divided S and T will be uh, the heat flow, and I will believe that this delta Q is just heat capacity uh, um, the, uh, multiplied on the density or the volume of the cylinder. Volume of the cylinder will be cross-section S, which I did not write here, multiplied on the length L of T, and all this uh, 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 whole heat capacity, uh, 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 no, this is specific heat capacity, this is a full heat capacity, uh, multiplied delta T will be delta Q. In the denominator, I will put S, which is canceled with this one, and temperature. And I will write that this is uh, in accordance to the Fourier law. This is a kappa, so heat conductivity, delta T divided delta X, which I will replace by length. So I will suppose that this length is small one. So instead of differentials, I put finite values. From this evaluation, I will immediately find that heat penetration length L is square root of he time, where he is a coefficient of temperature conductivity or temperature uh, thermal diffusivity uh, coefficient. And uh, if I were not so lazy and would solve uh, exact differential equation, the answer would be the same, but the coefficient pi would appear here. Very good. So now I will return to our pizzeria and I uh, will consider the bottom of my uh, oven where I put the, this disk of, uh, uh, disk of dough, future pizza, and I will see that uh, uh, I will compare two flows and I will find the temperature at the interface is T1 plus mu, nu T2 divided 1 plus mu. Nu is a parameter which characterizes me the couple of materials. You can see here the dough, food grade steel, fire brick. So food grade steel, this for electric oven, fire brick steel for wood oven. And here I give you the values of heat capacity, thermal conductivity, mass density, and temperature conductivity coefficient. What is important? That for the couple, when you put the disk of dough at the bottom of, of the fire brick, the coefficient nu will be 0.65. For food grade steel, it will be 0.1. So let's see. I believe to my friend Pizzaiolo, uh, Antonio, and the temperature in the oven, initial temperature is 330. Temperature of dough is temperature of ambient is room temperature 20. So I see that if in the oven the temperature is 330, so the temperature at the interface will be 208. So let's suppose that I do not have possibility, I do not have chimney. So how to bake pizza in electric oven? Very simple model again. Of course, there are very sophisticated uh, electric ovens where you can do this very good. But if I just will replace new from 0 0.65, so I will put on the uh, just the uh, steel bottom, the temperature will be 300 at the interface when if I uh, establish 330 in the oven. So I will just burn this. The question, what temperature I have to establish in my electric oven to have the same 208 at the interface, 
answer, uh, the uh, uh, answer is to search. So 100 centigrade less than in the uh, wood oven. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, uh, um, uh, what I, uh, what does it mean? Okay, I will establish to search even better. But remember that uh, at least uh, at 330, uh, at least half even uh, of energy comes from radiation. Uh, so uh, I need high temperature. So the thermal radiation, uh, the intensity of thermal radiation is proportional to the force power of absolute temperature. So 330 and 230, it is 604 against 504 Kelvin. So 6 over 5 in power 4, it means 1.2 in power 4, it means 144 square, it means 2. So I will lose half of the energy which arrives um, due to radiation. So the baking time will increase. And indeed, we did all calculations and have succeeded to reproduce. Uh, um, we have reproduced. So I did here the balance of energy which pizza obtains from below uh, due to thermal conductance, uh, then uh, thermal radiation from uh, the uh, walls of um, um, the oven, and I took into account even the fact that pizza is a black body itself and irradiate with the temperature of boiling water, so with 100 centigrade. In the result, we have, due to uh, this uh, simple but a little bit cumbersome calculations, we have succeeded to reproduce that cooking time at the temperature 330 in wood oven is 115 seconds. For electric oven with 230, 240 seconds. And if I increase temperature up to 390, so in this case, I will uh, reduce the uh, baking time to 70 seconds. Very good. I still have, uh, uh, probably I will change because about the, uh, physics of good coffee, I can tell you, uh, maybe I will show you. So in Italy, there are two main uh, ways of mm, brewing coffee. One is the, uh, I want to show you this beautiful uh, video done in uh, the uh, Grenoble uh, in the um, slow neutrons. Please see what happens in mocha. So water is black. It is not transparent for neutrons and metal is transparent. So you can see what happens in the mocha coffee maker. Uh, and you see how uh, the water uh, boils in, uh, in uh, the hermetic, not hermetic. In hermetic, water cannot boil uh, because always it is in the equilibrium with uh, vapor. Uh, but here, uh, there is a possibility to escape for water. And this escape, due to the elasticity of vapor, results in the filtration of um, uh, uh, water passes through the coffee powder, and in the result, you collect uh, in the upper part of this coffee maker, you collect the uh, morning coffee for many Italian families, traditional one. But uh, it takes several minutes. Um, the people from north, from Milano, were always uh, very busy, and in the middle of 19th century, they uh, uh, created a so-called espresso machine. So if, what happens in, uh, in Mocha? In Mocha, uh, the, uh, okay, uh, the driving force of uh, the process is the elasticity of, elasticity of vapor, which is due to the fire, which Mm, uh, uh, which mm, heats the coffee maker. So actually, you are always at the, um, uh, the border, the confine between the liquid and vapor. So you can travel only along this line of coexistence. Uh, sorry, uh, to the coexistence. So uh, filter, to make filter transparent, so to allow the water pass through the wheel filter, it 
is necessary to apply 0, at least 0 0.2, 0 0.3, the difference between internal pressure and external atmospheric pressure. So it means that uh, you can, you should increase your temperature with respect to boiling one to 10, 20 centimeters. So the uh, working temperature of the process is 100, one, uh, 110, 120 uh, centimeters. And so temperature 120, pressure 0 0.2. And it produces some coffee. But coffee consists of thousands of different flavors, and some of them a great temperature. So uh, the so Italian sommelier understood that the best conditions are not here, but here at temperature 88, 92 centigrade and pressure 916 atmospheres. So temperature must, must be, be below uh, temperature of boiling water at normal conditions. And pressure must be 40, 50 times more than in mock. And this is espresso machine where you have compressor and you have thermostat. So any point of this phase diagram is available to you. Sommelier decided this, uh, the parameters which I told you are optimal, and the engineers uh, uh, res, uh, um, constructed the corresponding machine which produced the uh, coffee, uh, the Italian espresso, which is uh, the, uh, by the standards of Italian Espresso Institute, you have to put seven grams of um, uh, coffee powder uh, at the temperature 80, water should be 88, 92, pressure 916. And in the result, you have to brew coffee in 15, 25 seconds. The, uh, it should be uh, 50, uh, 25, 35 milliliters. And this will be Italian espresso, uh, of course, uh, the coffee beans should be grounded, should be um, prepared and grounded in corresponding way. A lot of interesting questions here about the role of humidity in grounding, a lot of physical questions. But uh, last five minutes of my talk, I want to devote to, I do not have unfortunately time to tell you about physics of vodka, why uh, uh, vodka uh, usually is 40 centigrade, and whiskey should be stronger. Um, and uh, probably I will stop to show you some nice experiment. Uh, you can find the answers on these questions in my book, The Wonders of Physics, which is published by World Scientific and was uh, uh, translated in many languages, or Le Caledoscope de la Physique uh, by Attilio Rigamonti and uh, Jacques Villain and me, which I hope soon will be available in English. Uh, okay, so I want how to uh, return. I, uh, okay, now uh, can I make the um, uh, experiment? Uh, organizers, do you see me or not? Yes, we see you and you can make the experiments. Very good. So please, I have two beautiful glasses, the crystal glasses. Do you hear? Sound, it is very harmonic. Yes, yes. Now I will pour here wine. This is water, but will be the same with still wine. Do you hear still harmonic, beautiful sound? Let's clearly so, but yes. Sorry? Yes, yes, we, we do here. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. And now I will open the bottle of spumante. I will open the bottle of spumante. So, if I were in France, I would open champagne. But from the point, physical point of view, this will be the same.
the same glasses do you hear sound yes what happened i do not have i do not have more nice color of high frequencies because when i speak uh, uh, the characteristic uh, frequency is maybe a couple of thousand of hertz. But when you go to uh, hear opera, um, uh, Montserrat Caballier or <laughs> some great singers, so you enjoy the beauty of uh, 10, 12, 14, 16 thousand hertz. So the beauty of sound is due to high frequency overtones. Their mm, glasses are resonators. And they, when I put them in contact, they produce the sound of different frequencies. Or uh, when it propagates in the, I add water, so water doesn't change maybe uh, uh, um, the uh, value of frequencies which are excited. But uh, still, the propagation is uh, uh, not attenuated too much. While the difference with spumante or with champagne, that it is full of small bubbles. And these bubbles, they are also resonators. They have their characteristic frequencies, which you can calculate. And uh, probably, uh, so uh, there are two types of um, oscillations. One due to the um, um, CO2 in these bubbles. So these are radial vibrations. And you can just from dimensional analysis find corresponding, you can find corresponding, uh, uh, the uh, um, corresponding frequency. Or you can. Uh, find so this frequency will be you can uh, our uh, partic participants can check that uh, one frequency is uh, pressure uh, in power one uh, one half and divided density in one half and uh, characteristic radius of the um, bubble uh, another frequency you is related to uh, the uh, uh, surface tension. And uh, you can find that if you will take a look and see that our bubbles are of the size of one millimeter or um, half a millimeter, so uh, you will find that their characteristic frequencies are mm, uh, their characteristic frequencies are uh, belong to the range 10, 20 kilohertz. So actually they effectively absorb sound and you lose the sense of making change. So I will drink uh, one of these glasses uh, for the beauty of physics in surrounding us the world. Uh, the great scientist, mm, uh, I was lucky to be his co-author, the Tolle Larkin always told that um, physics uh, allows us not only to uh, uh, to gain bread and butter, but also uh, uh, satisfy our curiosity. So I want to drink for physics, which uh, uh, explains us all beauty of surrounding world. Thank you. I finish. Thank you very much, Professor Varamov. It was really interesting. It's fascinating to see how the physicist can apply <coughs> this uh, inquisitive mind to the cosmos and to the pasta and uh, the champagne, they call it the same. So for all uh, attendants, there is an option to ask questions. You should have a pop-up somewhere where you can type the questions. Unfortunately, we cannot have you uh, ask in person the question, but I will read them for you. So please don't be shy. There's no reason to be shy because you just have to write and uh, we will transfer your questions to Professor Varlamov, who will answer them on the spot. And as you are writing for them, uh, so take the time to think about it and, uh, and uh, ask your question in the, 
in the corresponding form. I will myself ask a few questions because, of course, this uh, calls for a lot of uh, questions. Your talk, um, <clears throat> including with uh, starting with maybe um, uh, what are you going to do with the uh, with the champagne now with the spumante? Sorry, uh, uh, I did not. Uh, do you ask me? Yes, yes. Uh, I just drink it. <laughs> One of glasses. I just drink. I would be happy to share with you this bottle, but uh, I am alone at home due to <laughs> the conditions. Of... Uh, uh, so, what is the physical question? Is no, no. That that was that was the first question. Um, there, there is this technique of cooking uh, that uh, I don't know if it's quite modern or recent, but uh, this sous vide that where people yeah. cook at low temperature and uh, yeah. because there is some uh, gain from the thermodynamic equilibrium. So could you tell exactly. us? Exactly. So I think that it is a very good question and um, it is very fancy and I think in UK it is uh, popular. So actually uh, sous vide you put uh, bread under the vacuum and then you carry it at the temperature and uh, you carry it uh, tens of hours maybe even up to 50 hours and at the temperature below the temperature of denaturation of your proteins so maybe i will do you see my screen now yes so let's return to uh, the second slide of my talk. So if I, uh, my system is below this barrier a little bit, so uh, the first way is to heat it to overpass this barrier, just due to heating of the broth or baking in the oven, or etc. So. Uh, increasing temperature of the system. Another possibility to stay a little bit below it to wait and to wait and due to the interaction of the bus you will have some fluctuations of temperature and in, the fluctu uh, in this fluctuation fluctuating way uh, some of the proteins can overpass this barrier to, to form because all of them from the native state you already the this uh, uh, the knots are unfolded but they still did not form carpet waiting long time due to the interaction with the bus and in, in uh, Arrhenius way with, with some probability of overpassing this barrier there is no way back so slowly slowly you form this you compactify these proteins and form the carpet i hope that i answered your question very interesting so i see that you use your skills with fluctuations and beyond mean field physics exactly exactly always fluctuations yes so we've got a question from one of the attendees who is a random attendee so i will not name him he's asking or she's asking what is the best way for keeping champagne fizzy uh, for what? For, for keeping for keeping the champagne or the fumante fizzy, bubbly, to keep the bubbles fizzy. of the champagne. Very uh, practical. Uh, you see, I know uh, uh, I, I, I know what uh, uh, this attendee has in mind. I know this trick that you have to take uh, you have to take a spoon and put it here and put in the fridge. And it works, but I'm sorry I cannot explain this. This is some magic, uh, uh, the miracle. I cannot explain. We discussed with a lot of people about it, and I cannot explain this. But it seems that it works. But what I will do with this bottle, because I will not drink all tonight, but I will just put cork very strongly. <laughs> what is beautiful with, um, you know, that the quality of uh, champagne, uh, okay, about champagne you can tell a, a lot of things and Fabrice, you as a, a French origin uh, physicist, you know better than me, but Dom Perignon invented this, uh, I can tell you the story of champagne, etc. But what is beautiful is this perlage. So 
the uh, formation of these beautiful small uh, bubbles and they're uh, going up due to the Archimedes force. But why they are formed? Because the champagne uh, made by uh, method champagneuse, so invented by Dom Perignon, so you take the simple white wine uh, or rosé and then you uh, were past the normal fermentation and then you add special liquor so you add some special syrup uh, or sugar syrup of course not the sugar which you buy in the supermarket this sugar should be for good champagne should be um, produced from the same grapes where uh, what uh, you use uh, for do first fermentation for your wine and then you add uh, this syrup and you add yeasts and you close now uh, your uh, this wine with yeast and this transport uh, syrup you put in the bottle which has to resist up to seven atmospheres because Dom Perignon was involved in this story because in the uh, um, uh, uh, abysses, uh, the, uh, uh, due to some uh, the, uh, cold winters, uh, some, it was some period, uh, so the bottle started to, uh, um, to explode, uh, explode. And uh, he found this way. So, and finally, the second ferment fermentation happens in the bottle. And because the bottle is closed, so high pressure can develop in it. So the result of activity of these bacteria of yeast that they produce CO2. They produce not only alcohol, but they produce only also gas CO2. At the normal fermentation, this gas go away. In the hermetic bottle, it remains. And um, wine has this ability, and water also, to dilute under the pressure to uh, host more and more. Uh, gas in it, and some metastable state appears where the uh, pressure or the contents of CO2 in the champagne, in spumante, is much higher than it would be in equilibrium conditions. But what is beautiful is that this state is metastable, so it can uh, 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 naturally, that in bottle under the uh, pressure of several atmospheres, uh, it is stable. But even when you uh, uh, pour your champagne in the glass, so still you several hours you can see this perlage if champagne is good with the um, just sparkling water. Will you not go, or if you will buy with? Uh, two euros, uh, three euros per bottle, it will be just full of CO2, but without this uh, serious process. So uh, uh, this is very beautiful physics in this and good uh, result. Very interesting. Thanks again. Uh, maybe one last question. No, uh, we've got a question there. Why is the steam getting out when you open the champagne bottle? Sorry? So the question is, this is from uh, Kasia Sopinska, she's asking, why is the steam getting out when you open the champagne bottle? Not steam, uh, this uh, CO2. Ah, steam, I understand what he, okay, yeah, 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 I understand this. Uh, so uh, I would say my hypothesis is that when you open the bottle, what happens? You have a diabetic about a diabetic process. I mean that excess gas exits from your bottle very fast, diabetically. And this means that the temperature decreases here because volume increases, temperature decreases. And from surrounding uh, um, uh, air, you have condensation of uh, water uh, 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 vapor, which uh, exist, but um, because locally temperature strongly decreases, so you see this, it seems that it is a steam. So I think that this is related with the adiabatic expansion of the gas 
which is contained in the upper part of the body. Okay. This is and my hypothesis. Uh, I can uh, tell to people who lived in cold countries. So imagine that you stay at the hot kitchen where uh, the uh, humidity is 100 centigrade. So uh, someone boil meat or something and uh, it is hot, 20 centigrade. And out it is minus 20. Uh, I tell you about Russia. So uh, I not I uh, observed this phenomenon many times, and this is similar to the, what happens here. So if you open the part of your window, I don't know how uh, to call it in English. Uh, uh, only some part of window you can open to allow allow to enter fresh air. So if you open this piece of window, so cold air will enter in your kitchen and very interesting phenomenon the observer from the outside will see the steam but observer inside also will see the steam because cold uh, cold uh, air will fall down and the humidity uh, the water which is contained in your uh, atmosphere will condense in it and you will see that it fall down but from outside i did it you will see the hot air which will go up and bring with it also uh, water and you will see, see steam so i think something like this happens with uh, the bottle fascinating i can see we could have you uh, speaking all night about these things I will ask the last question, which is interesting because it comes from Anton Nalitov and he's always asking interesting things. The only thing that is that the question is too long to fit in the form, so I hope I will not distort it very much. He says, I'm reading, a question regarding the interpretation of the Spaghetto experiment of 2018. You mentioned that in the case of applied torsion, the released energy is spread among different sound modes. So the regular transverse sound part is smaller than in the case with no torsion. However, the release energy itself should be higher, as the torsion energy also contributes to it. So it's not evident that the transverse mode amplitude decreases with torsion. Is my understanding correct? Asks Anton. So please don't ask me to repeat the question. I hope from what you could catch. Uh, so yeah. if I understand well, uh, so I would say that energy uh, uh, of, for all our pleasures, so for all modes, is produced by the break. So it is elastic uh, and uh, the energy of the break of this uh, spaghetto. And then we have two different modes. Uh, one is rotational one, another flexion. So, uh, 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 so uh, the fact that it breaks in two, I, uh, everyone can check. I can show you. Now I can show you. So please, here, I have three pieces. Did you see third one? Probably not, but I do not cheat you. I will uh, wait till uh, uh, uh -huh. We yeah. trust you, we trust you. Yes, you see three pieces. Now I will try to repeat the experiment of these uh, youngsters from MIT. So I take a uh, two. Two. Look, I do not cheat you. Two. Look. Ah. Two pieces. So I did not cheat you. The treatment of this is beautiful. I'm happy that I have succeeded to show you experiment and lady who uh, will clean my uh, studio will not look for <laughs> <laughs> I will, did not give her more uh, work. Uh, so it works. Uh, so I believe that the energy which is released is uh, uh, related with this break. And But in the case of simple breaking, uh, all it goes to the uh, pleasure uh, uh, mode. In the case of Rotation, it, uh, there are two modes. Okay, but that's the explanation which students gave is correct. 
So thank you very much, uh, Professor Valamov. You didn't cheat us indeed. The talk was really as fascinating as we could imagine it would be. Uh, maybe I'm sure everybody would have liked to hear a bit about vodka, but we have to leave things for the future. And uh, I hope, I, I think we will give this talk again and again in other places. So it will be a joy to try to catch the bits that we missed uh, on, on this occasion. So thanks again. I think that... Uh, uh, dear Fabrice, thank you very much for this uh, occasion. To Unfortunately, I do not see uh, this is a, um, the, the advantage of uh, uh, online teaching and the seminars, but for me it is a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much for possible to you, to Paul, to David for um, uh, giving me possibility to deliver this talk, and I hope that uh, it will at least um, generate some questions of our uh, attendees. Uh, and uh, I strongly recommend the method of dimensional analysis to answer on many questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Valamov. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. That uh, terminates, that closes our, our lectures for today. Goodbye. Goodbye.